I'm Greg, and you're listening to Totally Preventable. Totally Preventable. Totally Preventable. Totally Preventable. Totally Preventable. Totally Preventable. Hey, Polly, we got a good one today. Oh, yeah? Oh, yes. So this is actually an organization that you're familiar with, but I had no idea. Uh, PONY, which stands for... Preventing overdose and naloxone intervention. Well, now, how how is your connection with that? So, um, Michelle McKenzie Mm -hmm. is the director there, and um, she trained me to train other people in Narcan. She trained you. Yep. Yeah. Our Narcan naloxone guru. Yep. Wow. She's my sensei. Well, right. there you go. Yeah. There you go. So this is going to be very good. I have a lot of questions. I was one of those uh, one of those people who I was first introduced to the Narcan naloxone trainings when it was the syringe. Yes. And I was, uh, I don't know. I didn't know if I could give a needle to someone, like other than the level, I didn't know if I could give a needle to someone. So I'm going to be asking some questions about that kind of stuff. Yeah, we still have them. Um, we can do either here. Yeah. No one ever wants the syringes. Yeah. Yeah. I can see. I it's can a whole see. nother process, but now with the nasal Narcan, so easy. Wow. Now, if you're trained for one, are you trained for both, or do you have to go through two different trainings? Mm. It's two different trainings. I mean, yeah. you could do them both at the same time, but yeah. All right. See? Go right to the guru. And to find out that the guru has a guru right? is even bigger. Yeah. So without further ado... Hi, everyone. We're here today with um, Michelle McKenzie, Director of Pony at Miriam Hospital. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure's ours. We're very excited. Um, So I said you were the Director of Pony, but I didn't tell anyone what Pony is. Could you tell us what Pony is? Certainly. It's Preventing Overdose and Naloxone Intervention. Super. Um, So how did you get involved in this program? Um, So actually, I co-founded Pony with our medical director, Dr. Jody Rich, in 2006, and it really was a, um, I I have to say, my my interest in um, making naloxone available to folks, because what Pony is, is uh, a project to um, do overdose prevention education and naloxone distribution. And when we started this work in uh, 2006, it really was from my experiences at uh, the Department of Corrections in which we were working with folks to link people who were um, struggling with uh, addiction to heroin or heroin use disorder. Um, and when uh, and it was to link folks to treatment and, and that at that time, it was specifically methadone. So this was the late 90s. Um, linking folks to methadone post-release. And what was clearly evident to me is that for folks who um, didn't pretty immediately make it to treatment post-release, they were at high risk of overdose. And um, I I was just ignorant about the degree to to really how devastating opioid use disorder can be. And um, so in addition to working to link people to treatment, we recognized that there were other things that we could do to support people. And some um, colleagues in the mid nineties, harm reduction colleagues actually had begun working with folks who use the needle exchange to provide um, uh, lay use of naloxone. And so in Rhode Island, we were not uh, the, the work had been going on in many other states, a number of other states when we started the work in 2006. So we actually, the path had been laid for us. And um, and, and really my interest in um, distributing naloxone and doing overdose prevention education was my experience of working with folks who were so at such risk of overdose leaving incarceration. That is something I've, I never put a, a, a lot of thought into, but that must be very tough. Well, once you're released, I mean, you've got so much, I, I'm assuming there's so much that you have to do. And then, you know, you've got so many people who want to see you and you're becoming reestablished with everything. And if I didn't, you know, if you don't get into the program or your program might be the last thing on your mind, 
Okay, that wow, that is something I, I didn't put much thought into. Hey, thanks for telling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always felt I was going to get very educated in, in this podcast. <laughs> um, so, can you? Because I, I, I'm a little confused on this. Can you tell me the difference between Narcan and Naloxone? Oh, so that's an actually easy and great question because a lot of people have that confusion. Naloxone is the generic name and Narcan is the brand name. Oh. So Narcan is the um, that one step intranasal, you know, you just push the button mm -hmm. um, and Naloxone is just the generic name for that, the medication that's used. Uh, so Narcan has... Um, four milligrams of naloxone in each administration and is there still a, a shot or is it yes the nasal? there that there certainly is so pony when we began in 2006 there was only intramuscular administration of naloxone um, and we have we have continued um, providing uh, intramuscular naloxone this entire time and the primary reason for that has been that it is much, much, it's generic. It's the generic form. So we just get the one CC. Um, you know, should I have a, here, here is the Narcan, right? So this is the intranasal. And then this is the, um, these are the um, pony uh, kits that has two intramuscular syringes and two doses of generic naloxone. Um, and we continued offering it because uh, we could only afford it. A Pony for the very first time uh, was funded by the state beginning this year. This is our very first year of being funded. Congratulations. So every, um, every other year before now, it was really catch as catch can. And I will tell you that what that has meant is that we've been very resourceful. We have relied tremendously on our community partners. For instance, AIDS Care Ocean State and their needle exchange program has donated all of our intramuscular syringes um, until we got funded. And actually, actually still the last time we did, it was still through um, AIDS Care Ocean State. And um, we it volunteers put the kits together um, and our community partners often had volunteers. So we may just give the materials to them. Um, and, and we even had, you know, I was telling you about the really pioneers and laid um, distribution of naloxone. Um, when, when there were times when we didn't have enough money, they donated naloxone. So it really afforded us the opportunity to be rely have a have a, a really interconnection with our partners because we that was the only way we could do it. Mm -hmm. Michelle, could we even take a step further back for anyone listening that doesn't know what naloxone or Narcan is? That's such a great question. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what is naloxone? Naloxone is a is a medication that is used to reverse the effects of opioid overdose and particularly what it does is allow the person to begin breathing again. Um, and so what happens when someone ex uh, uses opioids, any opioids for any reason, the opioids sit on the um, uh, opioid receptors in the central nervous system. And um, there's many, many different things that impact whether someone will have an overdose, um, but if they have other substances in their system, if, for instance, and this is happening really much more now, for people who are not expecting opioids, so they're not using opioid substances, so it could be party drugs like Molly or Adderall, well, uh, di different party drugs, um, or cocaine or methamphetamine, um, or they may be using pills that they think are Percocets or, um, and particularly, you know, maybe low dose Percocets is what they think they're getting any, which is an opioid, but, you know, has a low um, dose of Percocet opioid in it. Um, these substances now can have be laced with fentanyl um, and it's only a small percentage. So it's a small percentage of pills. It's a small percentage of cocaine. 
But for people who don't regularly use opioids, if they're the one who gets that, you know, that laced substance, they are very vulnerable to overdose because they don't have a tolerance. Um, for people who regularly use street opioids, which is now fentanyl in our state and all along the North, you know, in on the East Coast, there is not heroin really available. Um, it, for folks who use fentanyl, then they have a, a, a tolerance. So for people who are, uh, it's different, their vulnerabilities are different. So if for people, for instance, you know, I gave the example of people who were incarcerated, if you lose your tolerance as you build, like with alcohol or other substances, as you build a tolerance, if you stop using for any reason, then you lose your tolerance. So if you go back, to use, then it is at, at the same amount, then that is a time someone's vulnerable to overdose. So, uh, or if there's multiple system, multiple substances, for instance, uh, opioids and alcohol, because those are both depressants, opioids and benzodiazepines, both depressants, but even opioids and uppers, because then you're, you can't, are not able to perceive the dose that's safe, right, or safer. So these are all things that contribute to overdose. But basically what happens, opioids sit on the um, opioid um, receptors in the body and depress breathing. And depress breathing to the degree to which if it's not intervened, then the person can die. And, and that's what causes overdose death. And um, what naloxone does, and it's kind of amazing, is it goes into the receptor. That's the only place it works in the body. And it kicks the naloxone off of the, I'm sorry, kicks the opioids off the receptor. And so that allows the person to breathe, um, start breathing again. And what's happened with fentanyl is because fentanyl has, is, sticks really hard to those receptors, Sometimes it takes multiple doses of naloxone to, to kick it off. Um, but that's what naloxone does. It allows, it just the only thing it does is to allow the person to breathe. And if, um, in the, and the reason that it's been sort of kind of such a great medication for lay folks to use is because I don't have to be 100% certain that the person is actually experiencing an opioid overdose. There are signs of an overdose, which is the person's having trouble breathing or no breathing. Maybe they're gurgling. They change color because they are not getting oxygen in the body like they need. So they're going to be pale. The lips and fingertips are going to be uh, if lighter skin colored are going to be blue purple, darker skin colored are going to be gray ashen, um, and they're not responsive, right? So those things say, oh, that's probably an opioid overdose. Um, I may try to get their attention. I may use a, a pain stimuli, which is the chest nuggie or sternum rub. Um, but and if 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 they don't respond and if they're ha clearly having problems breathing, I'm going to call 911 and administer naloxone. Um, and, and then help them breathe. And so that's a, a, you know, it's great to know CPR because if you can do chest compressions and I'll talk about in a second, why chest compressions are important, but, um, breathing, they need oxygen. You think, oh, we'll just focus on breathing. That's true. Um, but a lot of folks aren't comfortable doing rescue breaths. But the other thing is that if you come on to someone and you don't know when they experienced an overdose, it's possible that they actually had, because fentanyl works so quickly in the body, they may actually be experiencing a cardiac arrest as well as not breathing. Oh. So then the full CPR with the chest compressions and rescue breaths are ideal. And since, you know, there's just a lot of people and people may be more comfortable with chest compressions. Um, so you basically 911, administer naloxone, help the person breathe either through CPR, full CPR, just rescue breaths or just chest compressions according to level of comfort. Um, and two minutes later, if the person hasn't started breathing, then you're gonna minister the second dose. Um, and basically 
if the person, once you've administered that dose, and let's say that I, okay, I was wrong, right? It wasn't, it was a benzo. It was, it was from, there's a new dr- substance in this, in our drug supply now called xylazine. Um, it's a tranquilizer. And so it really makes a person pass out. It's actually in Rhode Island only been found alongside fentanyl. So naloxone would still help because it would kick the fentanyl off of those receptors. But let's suppose that it's just benzos. It's just alcohol. It's just whatever. The great thing about naloxone is that it will not hurt the person and you've called 911. So you've done everything you can do to support that person. Um, And so for that reason, because it's so um, such and further it's stored at room temperature um so it's easy to keep and store it's just a great it's really an important drug for all of us to have around next time i have to do a training i'm just going to play this podcast i think so i have so many questions just off from, from that answer um one question is i i think it's important you said people who have the very low tolerance and the vulnerable how much fentanyl does it take I think that people really, I think they hear it. We, you know, we hear it on every news cycle. We hear it just daily. But how much fentanyl does it take for a person with a low tolerance, a vulnerable person? How much does it take to, to put them possibly in the overdose realm? Right. There is actually a campaign that the health department is doing now. And, and Greg, I love the fact that you talk about tolerance because it makes such a difference for somebody who uses regularly. It's different. Right. Mm -hmm. But for someone who is not using and exposed inadvertently, right, that wasn't just not what they intended, then it really doesn't take much. There is a campaign that's run by the health department now, and it's it basically on one side of the card or flyer, it says, did, did, you, uh, did you know your cocaine, Addies, Perks, blah, 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 could have fentanyl? And then on the other side, it has a pencil, and then just the amount on the pencil lead is what it demonstrates. And so it is it again for people who use that it it's it, it dose is based on tolerance among other thing other things there's more involved than that but uh but people who don't have tolerance it doesn't take much wow wow I, can I ask another one Ruby? yeah all sure. right another yeah. question that I have. <laughs> now uh with the the CPR and the Narcan and the CPR um the combination and you were saying you know it two minutes, you administer the second dose. In that two minutes, we're doing the CPR. Does does it have to be both the chest compressions and the the mouth to mouth, or can it be one or the other? Or So really any of it is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, if sort of the, the strategy is that if people are comfortable giving both rescue breaths and chest compression, that's sort of ideal because you're both addressing the potential for cardiac arrest through the chest compressions and you're getting oxygen in the system through the rescue breaths. Um, it, but let's suppose that you just are not comfortable going rescue breaths and you want to, you if you give chest compressions, you're addressing the potential cardiac arrest. But the other thing is it does sort of help move oxygen around a little bit. So it's not perfect. It's not the same as rescue breaths, but it, it does help. Um, so, yeah. So, but, I, yeah, I find when I train people, I'm not a CPR trainer. Mm-hmm. So I can't go in and train people and tell them you have to use CPR because mm-hmm. I haven't trained them how to do right. CPR. Right. So I did hear that some, um, maybe the Red Cross is now adding uh, naloxone training to their CPR training. Not- I've heard that too, Polly. And so, <laughs> but in two, and so, and, and, and really CPR trainings, I guess, Red Cross and um, Heart, Heart Association, yeah. both of them do uh, CPR training yeah. in the community. I know in the past I've piggybacked with the training because they didn't do the Narcan training, but I think we were told that's going to change soon. I hope that's great. That is great. That is yeah. Great. Yeah. 
I'm at fault. Sorry. Go, go, go. <laughs> oh my God, I, told you. I, I feel like you probably have better <laughs> questions than I do because no, I know a lot of this. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> now, I am 100% guilty on this. I'm putting myself right out there on Front Street. I <laughs> am a person. I mean, being in prevention, I carry naloxone in my car. Okay. And, you know, hopefully I never have to use it, but I do carry it in my car. Now, this particular summer, we've had, you know, multiple heat waves. So it wasn't room temperature. And it's still in my car, but now the temperature is dropping, so it's not at room temperature. Is it still safe to use? I, I know if I had a new one, I just don't know. Should I throw out the other one, or is that better? Is would that be considered better something than nothing? So, um, so naloxone has been manu has been tested by the manufacturer to be stored at room temperature, which is basically sixty to ninety degrees. Okay, um, and what we know is that it's that uh, if stored at room temperature, it's good really past the expiration date up to there has been um, uh, test research done on a lot of different kinds of medications, including naloxone, and they found naloxone to be viable even five years post expiration date if stored at room temperature. There hasn't been the same kind of research done if naloxone is stored at um, really variable temperatures for a year. They did do research for 28 days and they found that it actually was still viable when it was exposed to very extreme temperatures for 28 days. All that to say we don't know, um, but what I can tell you anecdotally is that people have reported storing their naloxone in their car and then using it past expiration date and that it still worked. So my recommendation is that uh, if you have had it in your car for a year, I would actually trade it out for a new one. Um, and if you like, so here's the deal. You have to think it, where would I have access to my naloxone? And if you don't carry like a backpack or some sort of bag that you could just throw it in there so you would always have it with you, which is sort of the ideal thing, mm -hmm. um, because that both allows you to keep it at room temperature because it's wherever your body is most comfortable. Um, but it also, then you have it with you if you do encounter an overdose. Um, but if you're like, no, nah, that's not going to happen. I carry a wallet in my back pocket. I'm not going to carry it. You know, having it in your car is better than not having it at all. Does okay. that make sense? Makes full sense. I'm going to have to buy a fanny pack. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and, and what, what we can very safely say is that naloxone doesn't ever go toxic. Mm. So if you let's say it's years past expiration, it probably is not very effective, but it's not going to hurt the person. Um, and someone literally just told me yesterday, they found 25 year old naloxone that was at 50% viability. So it's like, I don't know. It's like, it's a hardy drug. Mm. I'm just amazed naloxone was around 25 years yeah. ago. That's awesome. I'm just going to act like I knew. <laughs> yeah, I, knew it was <laughs> um, I have a story I tell that. Um, so I keep naloxone in my purse. Mm -hmm. And my family and I went out to dinner one evening and I decided to be fancy. I don't know why, because I'm never fancy. And I just carried a smaller like wristlet. Uh -huh. so I just took like my debit card, some cash, my, you know, like the essential stuff and put it in there. And when we got out of the car, there was a person um, on the sidewalk. And my kids all looked at me, you know, mom, you got your naloxone? And I was like, hmm. I do not have my naloxone. Mm -hmm. And they were like, what? It's like you're, you, the, you teach people to carry naloxone all the time. You don't have naloxone. And I'm like, I don't have my regular bag with me. So that's when I decided to have some in my regular bag that's with me almost all the time at room temperature and to also have some in my car that in, you know, in a case like that, I, it was better than nothing. So, right. Exactly. Yeah. And was the person okay? They were, they were sleeping or drunk. Okay. Yeah. They, they soon stirred and everything was okay. But um, thankfully it was a little eye opener too. That you never know. Everywhere. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I believe that everyone should be trained in carrying naloxone, but um, 
could you tell us why? Like, what what are some some reasons we could give people that were a little reluctant to carry naloxone? Um, well, for one thing, in Rhode Island, and, and you know, we're a small state. I'm sure it's not it's not just Rhode Island that is true, but you know we're all very few degrees of separation from someone who's been impacted by overdose. I have lost friends and family members. I have, and I know colleagues and friends who's like like it's just sadly so prevalent. In 2021, 435 people in Rhode Island died of overdose. Um, the other thing is that. Uh, it, it's certain you can think about it like you think about CPR or AEDs, where if you are fortunate to live in a bubble in which there's no, that is not your personal experience that someone in your, among your friends and family who are impacted by um, uh, opioid use or opioid use disorder, um, there, I, I have um, done trainings with folks who reported that they were in a parking lot. They were in the parking lot uh, at Garden Grill. They just happened to be, that's where the restaurant they were at. They were in a parking lot at Whole Foods on East Side. They were, uh, go they were going to something downtown and it happened in Kennedy Plaza. I mean, there's just like multiple places where it, it was, uh, it was the, the, it was in the public in a parking lot, in a park, um, where someone was experiencing an overdose and the folks who were with them cried out for help. And there was, uh, in all of those cases, a, a, a stranger bystander uh, was able to intervene by administering naloxone and uh, supporting breathing. And of course, calling 911 and getting EMTs there. And fortunately in our state, and this isn't just our state, um, there's a Good Samaritan Overdo Overdose Prevention Act that protects people really very well from both criminal and civil liability if they intervene in case of an overdose. And, and so you don't have to be a medical professional, right? You don't, the, the tools that you use are safe. And so by using those tools, you're doing the very best you can and you're protected by law in doing that. And we always want to save everybody we can. Um, I think some people don't think of it that way, that you're saving somebody so that they can at some point, hopefully enter treatment and recovery. And we're going to, we want to save lives. Like, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, um, it is, it's what we do for, you know, human to human. Yeah. Now I, for one, am very happy that the nasal spray um, is out. I remember for when I first was trained, it was the syringe, the needles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was, you know, all truth being told, just a little skeptical of it. I mean, I just was like, oh, I, I want to save someone, but if I have to use a needle, I don't know how reluctant I'll be in that situation. Mm -hmm. If it's not a loved one, if it's an absolute stranger, right? I, you know, I, at that time, I thought, I, I don't know how to, how I would do this. Then probably a month after that, um, in a retail establishment and the person I remember like yesterday, a person was walking, um, they had their suitcase. They just got off the train. They were talking on the phone, talking about the person, talking to the person who's going to pick them up. Two minutes later, somebody's running out of the, that establishment's bathroom yelling, you know, we need help. We need help. We need help. And someone who was carrying, um, the, the Narcan in the needle form went it right on and jumped right into action. I was like, wow, you know, that was great. First of all, great. He didn't have it in his car. Like I, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he had a just, fanny pack. Right. Just right into action. I mean, and so you just never know when it could happen and, and you know how it will happen. But you know, that nasal, the nasal spray really makes me feel like I'd be a lot more comfortable. I remember reading about, or in the training, they said, you know, you, 
no matter how many needles because of the Good Samaritan law, or if you do use it and you walk off, leave the needles there so the ambulance can see or the EMTs can see. It was just a whole little thing for me that I didn't know if I could wrap my head around, but with the nasal, I, I'm, it's pretty easy peasy. Yeah, yeah. It is. Uh, and it, it's a great point because you want to make it as easy as possible for people to intervene. Right. Uh, and, you know, actually there was probably, this reminded me of when we were talking from the conversation before is that um, many, many people now are um, prescribed naloxone uh, when they have, they are co they're prescribed an opioid, right? The law changed in 2018, requiring that if there if it's a high dose opioid because of surgery, because of whatever, um, you get a naloxone too. So beginning in 2018, the amount of naloxone or Narcan rather uh, that, that was being uh, picked up at the pharmacy or leaving the pharmacy. Um, in, increased dramatically as a result of this law change. Um, but it's sort of, in, and so it's folks who already have Narcan and maybe, you know, all they have, they have a surgery, they, 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 they put there, they're like, I don't think I'm ever, you know, I'm never going to need this. And they put it to the side and they, that's it. You know, they don't think about it again, but actually by just having that Narcan, it's an opportunity to wait. Okay. Maybe, well, it's here for me if I need it my family so my family can use it but then I can take it with me so I have it in the community um and I can be the the first one there or, or you know um and that's something that I you know we have all we do have all these Narcan um kits that went out I feel like we could do more to sort of raise people's awareness that that that's a tool to save a life just as you're saying Molly is there an age requirement to carry or to, no. oh, wow. there's not mm -mm. not in the law not in the good samaritan law either and not in the um sort of the way it was set up that allowed so pharmacies there is not a minimum age for um being able to get naloxone at the pharmacy or it be pers prescribed mm -mm. Uh, okay. and of course uh, all pharmacies now participate in a standing order so even though naloxone is technically a prescribed medication, you don't need a prescription to go in a pharmacy and get it because um, there is a standing order. So you just say, oh, I need naloxone and you don't even have to be getting it for you. There was a law that passed that allowed you to get it for third parties and that your insurance would cover it. It's in the law. And so um, there's just a copay. Mm. Uh, unless you have Medicaid, if you get Narcan, Narcan is in the Medicaid formulary. I'm hoping um, pharmacies distributing Narcan um, will help with the stigma too, because I know there's a lot of people with the misconception about who are the people that are overdosing. Um, and so I'm hoping that if someone is having a surgery and then also getting Narcan that they're realizing, oh, I guess this means that I could overdose. And um, that, oh, that I'm not the typical person that I think, you know, or whatever think is at risk, you know, that it really could be anybody. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so we've talked about Narcan being harm reduction. Can you tell us some more forms of harm reduction? Oh, yes. So, you know, harm, I was thinking about this and I was looking forward to our conversation. I was thinking, so how do I kind of encapsulate harm reduction? And I really think that the, there is a harm reduction philosophy and the harm reduction philosophy, which I honestly think is very much tied in with prevention philosophy and recovery philosophy, which is I am worthy as I am and I deserve respect and dignity as I am. And that's how I think of harm reduction. And, and I was thinking about it like, um, and, and so so what that means is that, as you so beautifully said, Polly, that people who use have been highly, highly stigmatized in our society. And it's interesting because it, it's not every, it's that it is not a consistent approach to use. It's not consistent stigma. It's, you know, there's a lot of stigma, but there's some groups are more stigmatized than other groups. 
and um and you know the it, I, you know i think it's very tied into the criminalization of drug use which was very much a social control right whenever the whole war on drugs is very much social control and was targeting certain communities not all communities and so even though we know for instance that people across race and ethnicities and genders use comparably only certain communities have been particularly targeted from a law enforcement part point of view and so you know i think that all of that is you know there, there's a reason for this like <laughs> it's like it, it it has been a you know it's not just been kind of willy-nilly there's been intention and i think our you know, our, our, what's before us is, is we, we need, you know, it's dismantling that and recognizing what was the intention. Is that what we really want? You know, and I think the answer is no, that's not what we want. And um, so harm reduction really is saying, okay, what, what do you need right now? And, and, and so I, so things that support, help people be as safe as possible when they're using, um, there's the old example of needle exchange, needle exchanges. And in Rhode Island, uh, we have a really beautiful example of that public health intervention having dramatic impact in HIV rates in our state. Because um, in the early 90s, we had among the highest IDU injection drug use related um, HIV in the country, right? So most um, uh, uh, HIV was re in the country at the time was related to men who have sex with men. So that was true in other other states. Um, and in our state, more people uh, were it was related to injection drug use. And the reason that was the case was because we had harsh penalties for um, possessing a single syringe or, you know, you could, no matter how much you possess, but even a single syringe gets you five years in jail, five oh, years. Wow. Wow. And so what people did is they would that understanding the penalties associated with that, the paraphernalia of of, uh, of syringes would one person would take that uh, risk and then there would be sharing. They were scarce. It was scarce. And so people not only, we not only had high rates of HIV and hepatitis C, we also had a lot of um, people reused, reported reusing syringes many more times than, it, for instance, in neighboring Massachusetts. Um, and then the law changed uh, there, the needle exchange became uh, in the early, in sort of the mid '90s. This, we started the needle exchange program, which was great. But you know, of course, it was small and not reaching a ton of people. Um, it has grown and is is does amazing work. But what really changed was decriminalizing um, syringes and making them available in pharmacies so that, you know, in the whole time, you know, wherever pharmacy is open, you can have access to sterile syringes. And so as a result, what we saw was that I, as a result of these policy changes, which was making uh, access to sterile syringes available, um, inject injection drug use related HIV plummeted. And we, to this day, have almost no injection related HIV transmission in our state. Now, I will say our state has actually done a really amazing work around HIV, supporting people who are living with HIV and, and also prevention um, things overall. Um, but this is truly a public health uh, success story. And so harm reduction is sort of saying when you provide people the tools to take care of themselves, they are able to do a much better job. And so uh, needle exchange is an example, safe uh, smoking, uh, smoking materials. We've begun distributing smoking materials. And part of that is that it's recognizing that people who use crack and meth um, are 
uh, first of all, is recognizing that people need access to to safer just uh, to tools that to use as safely as possible. But besides that, it's uh, what we've seen is that there is an increase in overdose among people who use stimulants, and so um, it, and part of that is I don't need to worry about fentanyl because I'm not using fentanyl. Mm. So how do you have communications? How do you how do you message to people? Oh wait, yeah, you do. You that is, and part of that is you give you have access. You say tools. Here are tools that you need. And so let's talk about overdose prevention. And so uh, smoking materials, injecting materials, um, fentanyl test strips so that for folks who are using cocaine or pills or whatever, that it's like, okay, wait, you, you, you actually can test the substances to see if they have fentanyl. We've just started in this state uh, just this year, well, the end of last year, um, uh, testing uh, more it, uh, with different machines. So test strips just say if there's fentanyl, yes or no. Um, but there's more complicated machines that give more information about the drug samples. And when you consider that drug is only available, available through the black market, and so people never know what they're getting, that having the tools to actually say, okay, well, this is what's in the drug. So what do you, what, what information do we take from that? And how can, you know, presenting it in a way that people understand it's like, okay, yeah, I need to know that it's really consumer information. Um, so drug checking, um, is another example. And of course the, uh, uh, harm, uh, a harm reduction center, which passed last year, um, and hopefully will be open in the next few months. <laughs> Is it going to be at Miriam? No, it will not be at Miriam. The two, the organizations that have come together and seem like they're the closest to kind of moving it forward are Project Weber Renew, mm -hmm. um, partnering with Victa. Mm -hmm. Project Weber Renew is just knocking it out of the park. Every time I hear <laughs> something good that's going on around harm reduction or I'm like, oh, is Project Weber Renewer involved? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're I mean, pretty future, amazing. Future guests. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yes, they are. Um, they, I have to say, I, you know, I, ha it's been wonderful to see the increase that our infrastructure here in Rhode Island has really is, is blossomed in the last few years around harm reduction. Um, you know, really meeting people where they're at. Mm -hmm. So I have a question, and I'm not sure if I'm asking this the right way. So you you have a fentanyl test strip, and you and you're convincing the the user that let, let's test this. Mm -hmm. Does the I don't, I don't even know if I should ask or how I should ask. Does is it still able to be used? Uh, oh, okay, yeah, person who's who's using, is it still able to be used? Or like, is there a reason why they shouldn't test? Mm -hmm. So you, the amount of substance that you need is so small. Okay. But, but so, okay, that's not an, but that's, that's an important point to raise because if you need too much of the substance, then who's going to give that up? Right. It, right. It's like, mm -hmm. you, is that, that's not, that's, doesn't work, but um, for fentanyl test strips, and honestly, for the machines as well, it is, uh, you know, a tiny amount that's needed to test. Even um, if you, for instance, if you think of a baggie mm -hmm. um, that had substance in it, so it's like just the residue of the substance, that's adequate to test with a fentanyl test strip. You just have to add um, sterile water. So when we give out fentanyl test strips, we include um, the sterile water. It, it doesn't have to be sterile, water, but it can be whatever kind. That's to make it easy to use. Um, and you basically just uh, put the water in the baggie, um, put the strip in, and then wait. Um, you're waiting. What you're hoping to get is that it's negative, right? And so it may show up in just a few seconds, um, the negative result can take up 
It can take a little while, usually just a few seconds, usually less than a minute, but can take up to five minutes. Um, the thing about fentanyl test strips are that they're, they're not 100%. Um, for instance, car fentanyl is a very, very potent type of fentanyl. There's many fent fentanyl analogs and they have different potencies. Um, car fentanyl is a very potent one. The amount of car fentanyl can be so small that it is not detected by the fentanyl test strip, but it would be clinically impactful, right? And so, um, so what we always say is that it is a tool for engagement. It's a tool for having the conversation. Oh, you know, you should be checking to see if they're checking supplies, take naloxone, and here are our strategies to decrease fatal overdose, even if there's fentanyl in the substance. You start with the low amount, always use with other folks, always have naloxone, take turns. And that way you are taking, you're, there's layers of protection. So what do you say to those people who are, are against or don't really understand why you would use these, these methods? Like uh, not the harm reduction methods. What do you say to the to the naysayers? Right. Well, so I actually I'm a person in long term recovery, um, and uh, I have many friends and family members, you know, who who have a history of you having problematic use, right? And um, so there's just like that super personal tie for me. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, it gets back to this idea of how we where that stigma is, you know, alcohol, you can, it's legal. You can drink alcohol. It's like, you know, of course there's problematic alcohol use, but we don't, our approach to how to engage folks with problematic al alcohol use is, is a certain way. Right. Um, and the, if we, the, it's our policies that have created this environment in which people are at such risk, we have a prohibition and that prohibition on, on substances has created the black market. And the black market is what is so, is, is so dangerous. Um, and it's, it's so I, I see that the reason, and not to mention, of course, in prevention, of course, what do we talk about? We talk about support, recognizing that people need support around uh, uh, trauma, around abuse, around adverse childhood experiences, all of those things in a society that is unforgiving. You know, we're in a society that is unforgiving. So the fact that we, but, and I guess the other thing I'll say is that even with everything that I just said, the vast majority of substance use that goes on, it doesn't hit the radar of problematic because it is, it's, it try. It, most people don't develop substance use order. Most people don't get into problems with it, but when people do, there's reasons. It's not, it, it's not because they're evil or because they're, it's, it's reasons. And it's where, you know, where we, you know, our focus with, I love that our focus with prevention has shifted to caring for, not focusing on the substance so much, but on how are we taking care of each other? How are we, uh, how are we, how are we making sure that our kids, the way they learn, we're really paying attention. How do you best learn? How do you, how do we, if you are struggling with anxiety, depression, all how do we support you? Those are the ways that we avoid problematic use. Um, and when when people find themselves in the situation where they are are struggling, then cutting off tools to them, that's just not humans taking care of humans. I rarely have people at a training that are against harm reduction because they've signed up for the training. So usually that's their frame of mind, but occasionally I do, but like, I'll have like, um, 
a work-related one where everyone's mandated to go and there'll be a few eye rolls. I try to have examples of, you know, like um, a young person that goes to a party and just thinks they're doing, you know, one party drug. They could overdose, you know, so, or old people who have like pre-existing conditions and maybe forgotten, kept taking their medication or, you know, there are so many examples of, people that don't fit their, um, their mold of, of who they think they're gonna be saving. Mm-hmm. Not that I don't feel that we should save everybody, mm-hmm. but sometimes if you give them some examples of people that aren't in their head. Oh, right, that's a great helps. idea. You know, it kind of it kind of helps, I, I, I don't know, but you know. I agree. Michelle, if someone's listening in their, um, partaking in risky behaviors and they're like, oh, I wish I could get fentanyl test strips. I wish I could get, um, well, we know where to get Narcan, but I, I wish I could get some um, some of these harm reduction kits. Where should they look? Where should they reach out to? So um, there are different organizations in the state that have fentanyl test strips. Um, so Project Weber Renew, of course, has fentanyl. <laughs> of course. AIDS, <laughs> AIDS Care Ocean State has fentanyl test strips. Community Care Alliance, um, their safe haven program has fentanyl test strips and Parent Support Network has fentanyl test strips, but that's a lot to keep up with. Mm-hmm. If they go to Prevent Overdose RI, which is, you know, PORI, Prevent Overdose RI, um, if they, they, there's a bunch of information there, including where to get Narcan, where to get fentanyl test strips and um and other sort of safer use stuff. Awesome. Now, for people um, who are looking to get trained in Narcan, where should they go? Okay. So if someone is interested in doing like what Polly did, which is to do a train the trainer, like they want to go out and train other people, then they can actually come to the, just contact me and they can do that through the pony. It's a, uh, P-O-N-I-R-I dot org, Pony website, and they can just say that that they would like to do that. Um, But if they want to just get trained in, oh, I want to make sure I know how to use naloxone, they can do it on PORI. Um, uh, So PORI has training, the Prevent Overdose RI has trainings about how to use naloxone, and it has locations where to get naloxone, and it has um, locations of where if you want in-person training versus like video training, you can all of all of that's on Prevent Overdose RI. You could also check with your local prevention coalition. That is very true. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. For me, I just walked down a few doors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, actually, um, Polly, who, where, where are um, fentanyl, like, where, where are fentanyl test strips uh, in you guys in the your neck of the woods? Um, in my office, really? <laughs> not a great place for them. We are really trying to um, reach out to local bars and restaurants and establishments, and um, see if we can get some partners in um, in this. Um, we haven't quite come up with a good strategy yet, so that they're um, available for distribution without just being just out willy-nilly to get abused or or wasted we want to make sure they're meaningful distribution so um we're working on that um i wouldn't be surprised if maybe hope recovery has Mm -hmm. some oh that's it yeah that's and if they don't i'm going to reach out and check and get them some so Maybe by the time this airs, they'll have some. <laughs> so you just so you know, Polly, for any organization that's interested in getting like a a, a lot of fentanyl test strips, uh, they can um, just go to pony uh, p o n i r i dot org and um, order them because we're um, we're sort of supplying them for this for organizations in the state. Wow. All right, excellent. Wow, super. That is yeah. Great. And if you're like me, you have to figure out how to get all the way to Providence to pick them up. <laughs> sure, you know somebody on the other side of the bridge would pick it up for you. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, this has been wonderful, Michelle. Um, you've shared so much information with us. Um, 
it's been great. We're, we're glad to share this message and hope to get people trained and open their minds to um, harm reduction. Thank you so much. And what you guys can do wonderful questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> well, we greatly appreciate your thank time. Thank you. Yes. Thank and you so all much. The education you provided today. I know you answered a lot of my questions. So thank you very much. You cleared up a lot for me. Great. Have thank a wonderful you. day. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. I'm Polly, and you've just listened to Totally Preventable. Totally Totally preventable. Totally preventable. Totally preventable. Totally preventable. Totally preventable. Totally preventable.